All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our ongoing community conversation series about Invest in Open Infrastructure's 2024 State of Open Infrastructure Report. We're so glad you all could join us today uh, for the topic, Characteristics of Open Infrastructure. Uh, before we introduce our speakers and our panel, I'd like to start with some logistical and background information. And while I'm doing that, if those of you attending today's call uh, would like to introduce yourselves in the chat, just share your name and you know, your affiliation and maybe where you're joining us from today in the world. So welcome to this call. So this session is being recorded. We will share a recording of this session afterwards with the attendees. And at any time during our talk today, if you have a question, you can add it in the Zoom chat, and we will have a Q&A at the end. And I also forgot to introduce myself. So I'm Lauren Collister. I'll be your facilitator today. I'm with Invest in Open Infrastructure, and I'm calling in from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the US, and uh, looking forward to talking with you all today. Uh, one more logistical thing before we get started. We do have a code of conduct. It is linked on the screen. Um, you can read it, and if you would like to discuss anything related to that code of conduct, please do use the contact information located on that page. All right, let's get into the conversation. So I want to begin today with a brief introduction to IOI and the report, and then we'll turn it over to our authors for their, uh, their presentation about the makings of this chapter. First, a little bit about Invest in Open Infrastructure, who's hosting this call today. Um, at IOI, or invest in open infrastructure. Uh, we are on a mission to increase investment in and adoption of open infrastructure. And to do so, we take the following approach. We conduct research into questions and landscape of open infrastructure to guide strategies and action and the development of a shared agenda for making open infrastructure the default in research. We provide resources and analysis to do that, like the conversation that you are joining us for today. And together with our community, that's you, we pilot solutions and coordinate stakeholders to move towards a more open future. And the basis for today's call are the resources and analysis provided in the 2024 State of Open Infrastructure Report. This report was published in May of 2024, so it's only been out for a couple of weeks now. And it was our first report outlining the current state of open infrastructure. You can grab the full report at the QR code or go to our website. We'll have many links to that report as we go through today. You can read the full report. Uh, this, in preparing this report, we had several objectives. So we aim to establish a baseline of information about open infrastructure, illuminate patterns in funding and characteristics of those infrastructures. And we also wanted to raise the profile of those infrastructures that make research, scholarship, and publishing possible. And in the process, we investigated several topics and identified several courses of action. These are the authors and contributors to the report in alphabetical order. And this work was generously supported by the Mellon Foundation and Arcadia Fund, as well as our Sustaining Circle supporters. Their support makes this kind of research and strategic tool building possible. Here's a list of all the topics in the report. Um, again, here's a link to the full report. And today we are going to focus on the very first chapter in the report, which is the characteristics of selected open infrastructures. And today we've invited some special guests to discuss the topic. So today we have two of the authors of the report who worked primarily on this section, Gail Steinhardt and Sarah Lippincott, and they will discuss their approach and findings from the chapter. And we also today have two special guest panelists, Bianca Kramer from Sesame Open Science and John Maxwell from Simon Fraser University, who will share their takeaways and responses to the material. And finally, we'll have plenty of time for questions from you in the audience. So again, please at any time, put your questions into the chat as we go, as you think of them, and we will collect them to present to the panelists at the end. So now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Gail and Sarah for their presentation on the chapter of this report. Thanks so much, Lauren, and thanks to everybody who's joining today. It's really a pleasure to talk to you about this, and I'm looking forward very much to the conversation with our panelists today as well. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to give an overview of 
some of the methods, how we gather data for this section of the report uh, before Gail dives into our findings and, and um, gives an overview of some of the, the themes and trends that we identified. It, um, the data for the state of open infrastructure report, uh, the characteristics section in particular, was drawn from the same data set that we collected to populate InfraFinder, IOI's tool that lets users find, discover, and compare open infrastructures. If you haven't already taken a look at InfraFinder, you can find it at the, at the link on the screen, and I think that can be added to the chat as well. Um, we invited 84 open infrastructure services to participate in the first round of data collection for InfraFinder, focusing on tools and services that, that are uh, related to the repository landscape. 57 of those infrastructures accepted our invitation and provided information through a survey that populated InfraFinder and formed the basis for the data set that we used to write this section of the State of Open Infrastructure Report. An infrastructure, uh, we, we had a set of eligibility criteria for organizations or for, for tools to be included in our data set. Uh, they needed to be fully operational and active at the time of the data collection. They needed to contribute to uh, the academic ecosystem and the research life cycle, research life cycle, and they needed to meet at least one of the follow of our eligibility criteria, which included um, meeting the definition of open source software, primarily or exclusively distributing used to distribute openly licensed or open access content, being free to use by anyone being community governed and transparent in operations and finances and being operated by a nonprofit or non-commercial entity. Um, so these were, the infrastructures only needed to meet at least one of these criteria. So there are infrastructures that, there are many infrastructures in this data set that don't meet all of those criteria, but, criteria, but they need to meet at least one. The participating infrastructures were sent a partially completed data form and asked to correct or add information to it. Um, so our IOI team did an initial pass at data gathering. We collected the information that we could from public sources and then asked providers to fill in the blanks uh, and then went back and verified that information to the best of our ability. While our ultimate objectives are to surface patterns in the sector and to illustrate InfraFinder's potential as an analytical tool, the data set is, is still modest in size and scope. Um, as, as I mentioned, we only have 57 infrastructures so far, and our coverage is primarily in the US and Europe and with a focus on repository-related infrastructures. Um, but we believe we can we have an opportunity to continue to build upon the foundations that we've started and make this more robust and more impactful over time. Um, and finally, just a note on on why why these characteristics and why why do this uh, this assessment in the first place? Why collect all of this information on characteristics of open infrastructures? Um, and I. I'll just note that this work builds on a lot of other work in the sector, uh, frameworks like the principles of open scholarly infrastructure and the forest framework that help to uh, define indicators of community health and accountability to their stakeholders. Um, and so we believe that having this holistic understanding of an infrastructure based on these indicators um, that, that we've assembled here can help stakeholders, potential adopters or potential funders or other infrastructures that might be potential collaborators um, to, to get a sense of a, 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 an, uh, an open infrastructure's community health and how well that infrastructure might respond to their needs, what its trajectory as a community might look like over time. Um, and in preparing this report, I surfaced some interesting research that I've cited and, and maybe we'll dive into a little bit more later that correlates things like uh, transparency uh, in, uh, in operations 
in a nonprofit organization with a number of other success metrics, uh, like uh, an organization's success in fundraising or its operational efficiency. Um, so I think there's there there is research out there and and um, indications out there that having this kind of understanding of uh, of how an an open infrastructure operates can be a good indicator of its of its health, its responsiveness, uh, and its ability to be successful over time. I'll hand it off to Gail to talk a little bit more about what we found. Thank you, Sarah and Lauren. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of data in InfraFinder and we looked at just about all of it in the report. I'm just cherry picking a few of the um, metrics that we looked at. Uh, so just to start descriptively, yes, indeed, we did focus our attention on um, repository and repository related infrastructures in this initial round. That's the donut chart on the right and all of the segments, I'm sorry, on the left, all the segments on the right hand side of that are related to repositories directly. They're discovering system, discovery systems, publishing or repository systems or services. Um, and then the big light blue segment is, is other where there were only one or two instances of a solution category um, mentioned or included in InfraFinder. Um, on the right, we have for open infrastructures where having a hosted option available was was relevant. It's not really relevant for something like a standard or protocol, um, but for a repository platform, it definitely is. Um, so on the right, we have an indication of hosting availability. Uh, green mean the green segment means there's no hosting services available. So red, yellow, and blue together are are different hosting arrangements that are available. So by and large, um, some kind of hosting hosted option is available, which we've heard over and over again in the course of this work and some other research we've done um, that for libraries and universities that lack the capacity to spin up and host something on their own premises, that this makes it possible to adopt an open solution. You can go ahead and advance the slide, please. Um, I want to mention kind of the distribution of startup times for the infrastructures, in part because uh, in a later call, we'll be talking about our examination of grant funding, and we don't really look at grant funding over time because we have more and more infrastructures being started up over time. So as time goes by, there are more things to fund, and that becomes sort of a, a confounding factor if you want to start to look at funding over time. So I share this now because of the upcoming funding call. Um, but it is kind of interesting to see when things really got going. The two um, longest lived infrastructures in this data set are Archive and ARD, which both started up in the 90s. Uh, things really took off in the 2000s. We infer because of all the open access developments of the time, the, the Berlin, Bethesda, and Budapest open access declarations. Um, the of the 10 infrastructures that started between 2000 and 2005, those include two major repository platforms, DSpace and Fedora, as well as the publishing platform, Open Journal Systems. And then we have several more important repository and publishing platforms coming online in the teens. Those include uh, Fulcrum, Haiku, Janeway, and others. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Sarah talked a little bit about business form and governance, and yes, indeed, we do have a few commercial uh, infrastructures represented in the data set because of our fairly inclusive definition of open. That's the small blue segment in the left-hand donut, but by and large, nonprofits predominate, whether they are hosted uh, by an academic institution or some other nonprofit sponsor or independent. It's the um, red, yellow, and green segments. So strong majority of nonprofit run organizations. The strong majority also have some form of community governance. That's the donut on the right. So just over half, 56% have some kind of formal governance, meaning bylaws, some kind of legal, legal document behind their governance structure. Um, still like close to 30% have some kind of in more informal governance. So some kind of community advisory group, but perhaps not with a formal legal basis. And then just 14% have uh, no community governance that we could detect. Next slide, please. 
we looked at a wide array of policies and other kinds of um, information that infrastructures might make public. That's one way they can represent how they work in their and serve their user communities by being transparent about those policies and certain kinds of information. So we looked for the presence of a code of conduct, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, web accessibility policy, privacy policy, open data, and transparency and pricing. And um, the blue and red segments represent those policies or pieces of information being implemented and publicly available. That's blue or in progress, and that's red. And you can see pretty much across the board, infrastructures perform pretty well, where it looks like they're maybe not performing as well, the bottom two, open data and transparent pricings. That's because it's not applicable for a fair number of uh, infrastructures in the data set. So, you know, transparent pricing is not applicable for an application that's free to download and use. Um, so if you kind of squint and take that out, you'll see by and large, the infrastructures in this data set perform pretty well across these attributes. Um, taking a look at technical attributes, again, we see a pretty similar policy. So most of the infrastructures uh, have an open code repository and open technical documentation. Somewhat fewer, but still a majority either have an open have any open API or an open product roadmap, or they're working on it. Um, so again, that transparency and public availability of information is pretty good. And you can go on to the next slide. This will be the last one. Um, just shifting gears, this is not so much a, you know, just descriptive statistics, but um, we inquired about the funding needs of um, different open infrastructures. This was a free text response question. What's, what is your most pressing funding need? And then we coded those responses. In the grants funding data set that we'll talk about later in the summer, we coded the grants into the same category. So does the grant support community building activities? Does it support events and travel? Does it support operations? Does it support research and development? Does it support strategy and business planning and governance planning? Um, so that we could see whether there was an alignment between those express needs and the grants that infrastructures are able to um, secure. And so spoiler, there's not really an alignment there. Um, half of the infrastructures report that their greatest need is really meeting day-to-day -day operational expenses. And then about a quarter say their most pressing need is around community building support. With grant funding, what people are able to secure is grants are for research and development. That's maybe not a surprise, but it's, it's probably conventional wisdom. I think always nice to see data back up conventional wisdom. Um, but it does, that's interesting to me. You know, it seems like there's not a, I'm not saying grants are the optimal way to fund operations, but there may be a little bit of a misalignment between the resources that infrastructures are able to recruit versus the ones that they um, most need. And I think that's it for the highlights. That is it for the highlights. Thank you so much, Sarah and Gail, for sharing your perspective on writing this chapter and some of your key takeaways. Now we would like to turn to our invited panelists uh, to discuss uh, their takeaways as well as they read this chapter and heard this presentation as well earlier today. And just as a reminder for those of you listening in, if you have questions, please put them into our chat and we will collect them to ask our authors and our panelists in a few minutes. So I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see everybody as easily as the rest of you. And I'd like to start with a just a very general question. Uh, and Bianca, perhaps I can turn to you first on this. Um, what were your key takeaways from this chapter or what resonated the most with you? Yeah, thanks a lot, Lauren. And thanks for inviting me uh, on this panel. First of all, I would really like to congratulate uh, the authors and IOR on this piece of work, I think. And that's perhaps also my first key takeaway, how important this kind of work is. And there have been over the years a number of these um, data collections or types of catalogs, and they've all been focusing on different things. They've often been focusing on more the technical things, like what are the services out there? What discipline are they for? What, what do they do? And of course, you include it here as well. But I what I found really useful is specifically the questions about some of the more like operational aspects, some of the more financial aspects, the governance aspects, because I think that's really uh, a gap in knowledge that's uh, 
that needed to be filled and that's being filled by by this report so having that and your focus on that i think that that's super useful um i think also that comes with but we'll get to that probably a little bit later on uh today how that relates to what potential users are that be end users or institutions or funders looking at what to support uh, what they would need, what kind of information they would find specifically uh, useful. So I think that's um, that that's interesting. Um, but the fact that that it's there now, we can actually ask these questions like, what what of this is useful when deciding, for instance, what to fund or what to use, is is very useful. When looking through the data, um, I think there's some things to be said about uh, about coverage, which will also come back later, but I really also liked the, um, the visualization and what it enables to drill, drill down to, to what you specifically are interested in and what you would like to compare. And just a few things that stood out to me and that perhaps surprised me. Um, well, the funding needs, of course, didn't surprise me, but it definitely stood out to me that operations is so important and that also the community building is so important. And that's something that probably in the field we all know, but it's really good to have that spelled out like this and to really get that across. Um, I was perhaps a bit surprised by the non-applicability of price transparency, um, especially when you are a service that uh, are charging for for services, uh, true services, and then saying that price transparency is not important. Mm, that's that's interesting also from the perspective of an, of an infrastructure. Um, and finally, I think what resonated with me, what stood out to me as interesting was also uh, community uh, opportunities for community participation. And that for most infrastructures, that was about contributing to education and to trading. And very few infrastructures, even though a lot of them are open source, are actively involved in the community in, uh, in development. And that was also that something that stood out to me. So I think there's a lot more to say, and we hope I hope we will have the opportunity to discuss more. But I'll leave it at that uh, for now. Thank you for getting us started, John. How about you? What were your takeaways from this this chapter of this report? Thanks. Um, I'll echo Bianca. Um, congratulations on on getting this together and and getting it out into the world. This is important work. Uh, it's long term work. It's going to be you know it has been years. People have been asking these questions, and it will continue to be years. Um, I mean. I was struck by um, how this this work continues. I mean, in in this current form and in other forms, um, at some things that I think are still missing, or at least the framing seems incomplete to me. And I thought I'd take the opportunity to open up some of that kind of thing, hopefully in a in a constructive way that we can you know have a have a greater um, conversation about these things. But let me pick on one grammatical point. Um, the idea of calling infrastructures, calling things infrastructures as a, a singular noun or a plural noun referring to what I would have thought of more as infrastructure components, the idea being that infrastructures are not um, singular things that we can point to, but rather uh, complex assemblages. Um, and in, it's something that becomes infrastructure is, is, is kind of an achievement like, you know, you, we had, uh, if you go back to the history of technology, you know, we have um, electrical systems and light bulbs and things like that. And it's it's not that those things intend to be infrastructure or it's they're recognizable as infrastructure um, right away, but that becomes an achievement over time. And I'm going to, I'm sure everyone has been reminded this a million times. And if you haven't read Deb Chatra's book on infrastructure, you must, but that infrastructure is a relational um, thing. I mean, the, the quote, she says that infrastructural systems are defined both by what they are and what they're made from, but rather by relationships between various parts and how they interact with other, other elements of the network. And so I, I'm, I'm looking at this study and, and it does a similar thing that other studies have done, and including ones that I've been involved with, which tends to reduce these components to um, a kind of catalog. Uh, where we could go, oh, well, that looks interesting. We should get one of those. Or should we pick this one or should we pick that one? Which, I mean, is all very well in terms of the evaluation of of tools and software and things like that. Um, or from the point of view of a funder, is this a good project? Is this not a good project? But I'm, 
I think we're, we're missing a piece of what constitutes infrastructure. Let me give you one little example of that. All of these open source tools rely on GitHub. Not all of them. Some of them are work hard to get around GitHub, but GitHub underlies a whole bunch of these things. Almost all of these pieces, uh, at least the, maybe not the ones that are like the big institutional repositories, but a lot of these pieces will require um, big cloud infrastructure. Uh, you know, Amazon, AWS, or Google, or Microsoft, or things like that. So it's they're inseparable from these other layers, a lot of the pieces of which are not open. And so I'm I'm just I, I wanted to just take the opportunity to highlight the difference between a catalog of tools and components um, versus the achievement of the kind of infrastructure that is again Deb Chatra points out is gets to the point where we can now ignore it. Um, the ones that that are in here that are ignorable are maybe the big library repositories. Uh, once we've had them for a bunch of years and people stop thinking them thinking of them as products. Um, in Canada Hair Project RUD, um, I, I love the RUD people. It's a very boring project, uh, so you don't have to think about it very often. <laughs> um, that one, it starts to get to that boring version of, of infrastructure that you take for granted. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stop there because I'm, I'm really interested to hear what other people think about that, about what constitutes infrastructure as opposed to a, a catalog of pieces. Thank you so much for sharing that broad insight with us. I've, I've also heard those, um, as you called them, the boring infrastructures you don't have to think of. I, I've heard also the term uh, like plumbing thrown around where mm -hmm. some of these infrastructures that connect other pieces. Um, so lots of lots of terminology being developed here. Uh, I want to take this moment to invite Sarah uh, or Gail to share your reaction to this and in, in how you're thinking about uh, some of these uh, ideas that Bianca and John brought up. I, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to respond. I, I really like that you made that you brought up this point, John. I think it's it's really well articulated. Um, and, it, you know, we did throw around a lot of words, uh, you know, it's, it is something that came came up, are these tools, are they services, are they products, are they, you know, what what are they? Um, um, but your your larger point, I think, is, is the one I'm uh, more uh, especially interested in responding to, um, because I think it's one way that both InfraFinder um, and the report can expand over time is in making those connections. I do think that is so important that what stakeholders are, are looking for is to accomplish a set of goals or to perform a set of activities to make their lives easier to, to do their work that, you know, whatever that is, research or, or publishing or, uh, or what have you. Um, and a lot of closed systems and proprietary systems make that easy at least kind of create build these end-to-end -end solutions or build these umbrellas of products that work together and that you don't have to think about how one connects to the other they just do the thing that you want and they spit out the the end result um, and open infrastructures while they have huge advantages for interoperability because they're open, because they have openly licensed code, because they often inter incorporate open standards and because they are collaborative uh, by nature and in, in large part have a enormous potential to, to, to interoperate and to form the, these larger infrastructures, these networks. Um, but, but because they are, but they, they have, there are challenges because they are, working you know across different organizations and and globally around the world and they you know they aren't part of of one you know one company that is building a product suite um but making visible the ways that open tools can be combined to become infrastructure and making that visible making it clear and making it easy is what could can help adopters say here's the problem i need to solve what is the what is the whole kind of end to end solution I can put together? I was going to take sort of a sim similar tact on on that. Um, I think John, you said something about infrastructure infrastructure being relational. 
and Sarah raised the interoperability question. And, and that was that is something that we've heard a lot, that people want to understand what infrastructures op interoperate. And we really wrestled with how could we capture and represent that. And we started out with kind of a, we'll just, we'll just ask, like, what's your tech stack? <laughs> and we got, and that was a free text response. And we got the most interesting, unhelpful, diverse assortment of answers imaginable. Um, so we are still cogitating on that. And then Lauren was also at Open Repositories last week and mentioned her, to us Herbert von Sample's talk on the fairy cat uh, idea of how infrastructures could expose their interoperable interoperability affordances, I guess, um, in a machine readable way, which sounds really promising if people would implement that. Um, but I think that starts to get a little bit at the interconnectedness and it is very much on our minds. And the way we talk about it is sort of an artifact of the, our, the process of having to interact with 57 services, tools, infrastructures, whatever you want to call it, call them individually. And I think that language has just kind of like permeated the entire work because that was just the nature of the data gathering exercise, but it's a really good point. Thank you for that, Gail and Sarah. Now I just, a uh, moderator's privilege here. Um, John mentioned the idea of the catalog and Bianca, I know that you have worked on catalogs as well. So I'm really curious about your perspective on that. Yeah, that's actually my perspective is very much building on what Gil and, uh, and Sarah already, already said that ideally this provides a picture on more of the ecosystem of the landscape rather than just being individual parts of uh, the system that you can look at in isolation. And um, so I was very happy to see in the report also exactly those questions, Gil, that you mentioned about dependencies, about compatibility and about comparable tools. And I completely recognize the pain that it is uh, with those being free text questions, then what to do with all those answers and how to harmonize them. But I do think it's very valuable material. And if you could use them to sort of map out um, to map out those interdependencies, I think you have very rich material here to contribute to a broader picture of that landscape. And that together might then be more a picture of infrastructure than all those individual ones. Um, I do also think, by the way, that although we often talk about infrastructure as something that should be invisible, that that should be the things that are below the surface that makes make it all tick, we cannot afford to look at this, to consider this as something that should be invisible. I think especially when we talk about open open tools and open infrastructure, we need it to be visible because it doesn't sustain itself by itself. So we need it to be visible to um, to make sure that it's actually going to, to be maintained. But that's a bit of my own hobby horse. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you all for sharing that. And we're starting to get into this next question I wanted to ask everybody. Um, and I really, so John, I wanna ask you this first. What do you think that readers or stakeholders in this space, funders, institutions, anybody who is interested in this report, how should they apply or act on the findings? What would you, what are some of the recommendations or ways that we could put this into action? Yeah, I, I yeah, it's fundamentally political, I think. Um, I think what, what characterizes this kind of time and place in certainly in Western society, maybe on the planet generally is, um, is a lack of trust in institutions. Um, if if we lived in a world where we trusted institutions, then I think there would be larger scale support for open infrastructure for scholarly communications. And and in the lack of of a widespread, broad based, reliable, trusted institutions, everybody's trying to build up from scratch, and it's a little bit of a you know reinventing the wheel thing. Um, thinking of you know the National Library of Medicine. You know, which which built this enormous edifice, a big scholarly communications infrastructure in terms of indexing all of this material and doing all of this kind of stuff decades and decades ago. It's hard to imagine something happening like that, right, with centralized funding and and the kind of assumption of trust that went into that kind of project in the first place. Like it's in the 2020s. We don't live in a world where that kind of thing comes easily. So um I, I think the most important thing that I think 
the stakeholders should do is more talking to each other. Um, I think it's great to have a report like this. Uh, I'd love to see it followed up with a big, broad, uh, broadly inclusive conference to bring people together to talk about, you know, what are all the different layers and how how can we encourage the interoperability of it? Uh, you know, and there's this problem with the funding that I mean has already been gestured out today that um, most of the research funding cycles fund innovation. And that is not what infrastructure needs are. And that's why you've got 50% of these uh, projects listed in here, list operational costs as their main funding need. And it's like, there's got to be a broader conversation other than just these are cool tools. It's got to be, it's got to be more, more relational than that. So, I mean, that's my, if I had to recommend one thing to funders, stakeholders, you know, libraries, publishers, all of the different people. It's like, we've got to get more talk, more talking to each other. Ah, thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> Bianca, I wonder, wonder what recommendations you would have. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one because for me, it splits into two parts, which I think also goes back to the original aims of this report um, of IOI in general, both to do research to discern patterns and provide clarity on a, on a larger scale, but also to maybe organize funding for specific infrastructures and the question to what something like this could be helpful with. And I think those are a little bit in conflict or risk being being in conflict, but in terms of the broader picture, I think what's really important is this something like this as, as proof of what's already out there. And what John just mentioned, uh, the tendency sometimes is to, which I observe, is sometimes to either buy something from a commercial publisher, from a commercial provider, or build it yourself, build it in-house. And I think there's a world out there that this report very clearly outlines. There's a world out there that's of, of things that you can use and you can contribute to. You don't have to, to build yourself, but you can contribute to, and then therefore make it more useful for, for others as well, for the whole uh, the whole ecosystem. So I think driving that point home and really demonstrating that and getting people, more people to talk to that, to talk about that, uh, to follow what John said, is, is going to be very important. I'm also very interested myself in those stakeholders, whether they be end users or institutions or funders, what in all these collected data do they think is the most useful? If they have to decide what to do, what are they, uh, what are they looking at? And um, I would really like to see those uh, those five criteria that you used as eligibility criteria, um, maybe have a filter on those. And then, um, um, because I think they are a good entry point for for those stakeholders to, to discuss what is important to them. And of course, the other things that are in the report about uh, ways of governance or having governance material or all the, the more fine-grained ones, are very interesting as well, but those five criteria, I think having a conversation about that, like what's important when you decide what to support or what you need, that could be a very interesting uh, opening, uh, interesting to open that conversation. On the flip side, using this as also um, a spectrum or a catalog on what's out there, what could be supported, I think it's super important to make sure that coverage is going to be broader and there's, to, to get across that this is not a full landscape. These are selections. These are also based on whoever was willing to respond, but to make sure that this is not everything that's out there. These are examples of what's out there to illustrate the wider landscape, but um, yeah, somehow counteract the, the tendency to, okay, this is what you can pick and choose from. Thank you for that. And just a quick plug, you know, if you, do have an infrastructure you think should be included in our data set. We are going to be recruiting new entries for InfraFinder, which will contribute to the future iterations of this data set. Uh, we would love to, to have more folks represented around the world in that. Um, wonderful comments here. Um, Gail and Sarah, do you have any follow-ups of your own about recommendations that you have or in addition to Bianca and John's recommendations? Um. I think I think I'd like to reflect on like what I really want us to be able to do more of or better of on in the future. And one certainly is coverage, absolutely better coverage. 
uh, more complete coverage in the sectors where we're already working. And then we're also heading off in a couple new directions um, with InfraFinder for next year. So digital preservation and some data, research data infrastructure. Um, one thing that we tried to do this year, but we kind of ran up into difficulty and we've run into this difficulty before is uh, assessing financial health, which is, um, it's just a really, it's just a really sensitive collection of information that either organizations are reluctant to turn over, maybe because it's proprietary, um, or they're reluctant to have it shared because they're not sure what signal it will send. But it would be so useful, at least in the aggregate. So we're giving some serious thought to, is there a mutually acceptable way we can collect and share some of that information that will do no harm, but perhaps also shed some light on things. So coverage, financial health, and then the interconnectedness and interoperability question are places that I would really like to see us go uh, deeper in the future. And uh, Lauren, if I can can jump in as, as well, um, I think in terms of what I'd like to see folks on this call and other stakeholders uh, take away from this as, as actionable is that I think one of the things that InfraFinder and a report like this can help to do is to encourage values-based decision-making in procurement processes. So when institutions are thinking about what is a software that they want to adopt, what's a tool they want to adopt in their organization, that they can have a, a that there that there's a there are frameworks available that there's the the tool in, in infrafinder available and a kind of a normalization of this idea that that the the kind of the practices of an organization and the the way that it relates to its stakeholders and other other collaborators in the in the scholarly landscape is important and that and that it should be taken into account alongside the the features and the pricing and these other um, other things as well we want to and I think a tool like these uh, I think these can help to uh to normalize that and to provide the information that that um stakeholders need potential adopters need to convince decision makers to adopt a values-based approach to uh, to procure procurement. Thank you for that. I have one more question for our panelists. I know we have some questions from the audience, so we'll, we'll get this one last moderator question and then we'll turn to your questions. So again, we've started to talk about maybe some recommendations for the future iterations of the report. Uh, we have some ideas already that we've taken down, but I want to open up the question. Uh, so Bianca, maybe you can share with us first. Um, how do you envision this kind of research evolving over the next few years or, you know, what areas might require some further investigation? Yeah, I think I'm going to repeat both myself and some other people, what other people have, have already said. Um, but I do think one very important area is this is really by very much the supply side, if you want. And with all this collected information, um, expand this research into the demand side. So how do these things resonate with decision makers, uh, with potential funders? What do they think is important? And that can be both research and also a little bit of advocacy, because I completely agree with Sarah that the importance of value-based um, decision making. And I think having these open infrastructures uh, commit to these frameworks uh, like POSI and like CARE really shows their commitment to uh, to these values. And I think that's as a selling point, I think that's also important to to, to bring across, but to, um, to really connect with decision makers, also investigate what they think are, is important. Um, that's one. I already mentioned uh, broadening coverage and I think what I also said before, like based on the information you have, work more on mapping uh, this whole the the whole landscape, how these uh, the current infrastructure and other infrastructures, how they interact, and how the sum is more than uh, how the whole is more than the sum of its uh, of the parts. Thank you. Uh, what about you, John? What 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 do you see in the future for this kind of work? 
I'd love to see more uh, attention paid to the lower, deeper levels. Um, I just came off a day and a half of meetings here in Canada um, about the intersection of, you know, what we're trying to do with open scholarship and digital humanities and stuff like that with the, the you know, the bottom layers of research uh, data infrastructure in Canada, which to a certain extent is federally funded through big consortia and come to stuff like that, but it's really kind of dodgy. Um, but that's the bulwark against everything being in Amazon Web Services, right? Or Microsoft, whatever, or Google, whatever. Um, I'm I'm really interested in that part of the open infrastructure is what about the, you know, the servers, the cloud services and the network services that that open open scholarly infrastructures are going to rely on? Or are we going to cede that territory um, to the big, big corporations? and their AI farms. I mean, I think that's increasingly scary. Um, I'd like to see more attention paid on that side of it. And I know it's really, it's hard because we're, who funds that kind of stuff? I had to know AI would come up sometime in a webinar these days. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, yes, some really, really good uh, diverse pointers here. Gail or Sarah, uh, what do you, I mean, you did this research this first round based on your experience um, writing this chapter. Uh, what do you see in the future for this report? So I already answered that. I, um, I really like both uh, Bianca and uh, John's points on this one, and and especially I think I think we want to take our lead from the community, so from from everyone here and others who have read the report, who have used InfraFinder. What are the important characteristics? Uh, you know, what what are we missing here, or what are the things here that are most useful um, to to understand? Um, and and we can can expand on that. Um, I think the other thing I'm I'm interested in is you know whether there are other as we expand the data set and and grow it it's still it's still too small I think and too as as has been already pointed out it's it's too small and too self selecting to be to do any sort of um, objective kind of scientific analysis but I'm curious whether there are ways that we could um, could uh, whether as we expand the data set, we can draw out more more actual themes, see if there are, are trends or or correlations that we can find in the data um, to see what that tells us about the the health and the state of the ecosystem um, largely. Thank you. Uh, so those were my initial three questions for our panel. We still have several minutes left if somebody in the audience has a question. I did see a hand up earlier from John. John, would you like to unmute and share your question for our panel? Sure, um, thanks. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've done infrastructure for the past 20 years and the terrible irony is, you know, you get really good at it. The better you are at it, the more invisible you are, right? So we talked about, you want it to be seamless, transparent, uh, and that's exactly how it should be, but that's a terrible situation for funding. And um, so it seems to me, I'm wondering if this group has thought about a couple of things like uh, innovation in storytelling, like right? we really need to be better at telling a story about how important infrastructure is. And I'm thinking about tricks like, uh, you know, think of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, you know, guy thinks his life is terrible, and then you talk about well that he's had no, no impact, and then you and he gets the chance to see the world as if he weren't in it and see what what what's missing. So if we could somehow tell a story, make the invisible visible by showing how rotten things would be without what we're doing, but tell that in a in under two hours instead of like the wonderful life is a long movie. So. I don't know if that means just getting really good at storytelling or positioning uh, ourselves so that research money could go into, you know, research innovation in infrastructure funding, which is doesn't sound very sexy, but I think we really need to be better at this. So have you thought about that? 
Thank you for that question. Storytelling, open infrastructure, how do we get the message across? Uh, John, you looked like you were you had a had a reaction to that just, comment. I just want to plug Deb Chatra's book again because that's exactly what she's doing, right? It's it's this kind of funny looking book with the title "How Infrastructure Works," which is going to make a whole bunch of people just walk away. It's a fantastic book because she does the same kind of thing that John is talking about: is to make you aware of the levels on which this kind of stuff uh, is operating and how it gets neglected and the kinds of relationships that are required to make it work. Uh, there's somebody put her, Gail put it in the in the chat. Uh, if you haven't read it, read it. It's actually stunningly well-written. So I, I wish that was the beginning of a movement as opposed to just a single publication. Bianca, do you have any thoughts on this, this idea of storytelling or examples? I see you, you added SCOS in there. Um, yeah, actually. I was typing so hard, I didn't realize that Sarah just put it in there two seconds before me. Um, but yeah, that 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 really made me think that that's something that uh, that blog post from SCOS and full disclosure, I worked for SCOS until uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but they, they tried to use that metaphor, or not that metaphor, but that, um, that imagining, imagining a world without open infrastructure to really get the message home, what that would look like, and um, to, to, to emphasize um, the importance. I, yeah, I, I do think it's, it's very important, that message. You can, you can try to do that through data, but you will reach a subset of people who are really interested in that. I think the overarching message and the overarching story is also very important uh, to tell to to sort of rope people in uh, and to get people to engage uh, uh, with this. Absolutely. Uh, certainly. Uh, Gail, or I see Sarah's been adding in the chat. Gail, do you have anything to add to this storytelling aspect? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, to all of that. I think one of the things I struggle with in the research group is that we're doing research, you know, and, and I feel like we need to come at it from both ends. We need to say, what is the outcome we'd like to achieve and how can we get there? Uh, and so, I, yeah, I feel like we have to come at it from that direction as well, because the, the results of whatever we do are going to be whatever they are. I mean, having a, that outcome in mind might impact the questions that we ask and where we go looking for information. Um, but yeah, I feel like we sort of need to start at the other end there. And uh, I would say my strengths are not in the communications and storytelling department. <laughs> so we probably need to expand our team. <laughs> Great. Uh, so we did have another question come through in the chat that I wanted to make sure to ask you. So Gail and Sarah, this is a question from CJ Woodford um, about it, whether you, when you were uh, creating this chapter, doing this research, did, I know Sarah, you mentioned a few of these, but perhaps you could, could add a little bit more. Did you use any existing models or frameworks or typologies um, to inform your data collection or your response coding? And, and could you say a little bit more about how you drew from some existing work. I can talk about the the first part of that, and I'm not I'm not sure if this gets at the at the question exactly. But in terms of data collection, this work was informed by a lot of work that has preceded us. There, Educopia has has done work in this in, in this area. John has done work in this in this area, putting together. Um, uh, uh, you know, landscape scans and and uh, catalogs, and uh, Bianca has done this work as well. So we, you know, there, there's a rich uh, uh, history of um, other projects that have collected data about these same tools and products um, over the last ten years or more. Um, and so we we based much of our data collection off of. Uh, the types of questions, and in some cases, very similar, the same questions or, or uh, kind of existing um, sets of controlled responses that have been used by other similar projects in the past. Um, uh, and I'll let Gail, I think, Gail, you coded all of the, the kind of free text responses in this data analysis stage, so I'll let you answer that piece. 
Yeah, the, the question, really the only question where we did that kind of coding was the um, funding needs question. And that actually, I started with the grants end where I had more than 500 grants and I looked at them and I just categorized them. What are they funding? And then lo and behold, um, the expressed funding needs were easily, we could easily apply the same categories. Lauren did a finer grain analysis of that um, to like say, well, what kind of a community engagement work is needed here? Um, and you'll find that in the report as well. There was kind of a strong interest in, in DEI work, for example, which we didn't go that that deep on the, the grant funding analysis. Um, so let's see, where else might we have applied frameworks or, or lists? I mean, in terms of categorizing the infrastructures, a little of some of those categories came from existing work and some of them were just like, well, this is what we have. You know, <laughs> they are what they are. Um, and yeah, I don't think there's anything else formal that we used that Sarah didn't already touch on. Thank you for that. Um, so we're right, just two minutes left. And I think that might've been the last question. If anybody in the audience has additional questions, you can always get in touch with us. Um, again, I'm going to share my screen one more time to let you know about how to do that. And we have a quick poll in Zoom about your session today, if you wouldn't mind taking 30 seconds to fill that out. Um, and while you do that, please uh, note that we have in about a month's time, uh, our next conversation on the grant funding. So if you want to come on back and join another conversation and learn more about grant funding for open infrastructures, you can sign up for that, uh, as well as our newsletter, where we will announce future community conversations and additional materials that may be of interest to readers of our report. And of course, if you have additional feedback about the State of Open Infrastructure Report or this conversation and this talk today, we do have a feedback form that you can fill out to let us know your thoughts and feedback. And we have a, many other opportunities uh, available from IOI to get involved and you can find out on our website. Uh, thank you again to our authors and our guest panelists, Bianca and John. Thank you so much for joining us today for this wonderful conversation. The pleasure to have you all and to our community for your comments and your engagement today. We really appreciate you all joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again in, on July 17th for State of Open Infrastructure Grant Funding. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good luck and uh, keep going, you guys. Yep, absolutely. Same for me. And thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.